All right. Good afternoon, friends. Um, I just want to say thanks to the folks who were able to come early. Thank you, Emmanuel. No. And Jenny, who's being Anne's buddy, which is fantastic. Um, when Heather's gone, it seems like we need like a replacement team. I don't know. Anyway, um, so get ready next month when she flies to Chicago. Um, this week is the first in a sermon series that I'm calling Christian Myth Busters. And I just want to give a shout out to Alice for helping me brainstorm that. It had a terrible, terrible, boring name before that. Um, so the basic idea here is that Christians over the last couple of thousand years have picked up some bad habits and some bad ideas. And maybe it's time to bust some of those open. Admit the wrong, let it go, and look for God calling us in a better direction. And today is episode one hell. All right. Will you pray with me? God of grace and God of glory, on your people pour your power. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the facing of this hour. So I know that I give you an amazing title to look forward to, and then I want to actually go back to the Bible reading and not go and start from there, work out from there. Um, because this raising of, uh, raising of Lazarus is an amazing um, and very dramatic story. And, and uh, Mike, you did a great job being Jesus, and it was kind of like almost too much because the material is so, like, yeah, exactly. Uh, it's very powerful. And it comes as, it's a turning point in John's Gospel. Um, up through the up to through this point in the gospel, Jesus has been performing miracles, right? But these aren't miracles just for the sake of doing miracles. Um, last week we read about how Jesus cured a, a man who was born blind, and at the beginning the disciples are asking Jesus, "Who sinned to cause this man to be blind? Was it him or was it his parents? Whose fault is this?" And Jesus' answer is, "Neither." He was born blind so that God's glory could be revealed. And in the same way, Jesus waits until he knows that Lazarus is dead before he goes to him. The miraculous signs that Jesus does are for a purpose, to draw people's attention to what God is doing in and through Jesus. The kingdom of God is at hand. Eternal, abundant life is available to us. And these signs show both that Jesus is connected to God and has the power of the Creator and that what he teaches and who he is can be trusted. In today's story, Jesus demonstrates in this final sign the ultimate power of the Creator to give life in the face of death. I am the resurrection and the life, he tells Martha. Those who believe in me, even though they die, they will live, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And then to demonstrate this, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead after he'd been dead for four days, which is a long time. It's long enough for a body to deteriorate. So this is not a medical cure. It's something else entirely. Jesus recreates Lazarus. He gives him a new life because the old one was long gone. That is the power that Jesus has. I am the resurrection, he says. I am the life. And while this miracle is the final sign Jesus gives, it's also the beginning of his journey into Jerusalem and to his death on the cross. In giving life to Lazarus, Jesus initiates the process by which he will come to die and resurrect again. From here on out, the story turns us toward Jerusalem. So I wonder about a couple of things in this story. First of all, I wonder if Lazarus remembers being dead. And why don't we get to hear a little bit of that story? I mean, you know, really, it would have settled a lot of arguments if Lazarus could have just remembered to write down his experiences and then have them published. You know, something like, so I was floating on some clouds and there were angels all around. They had harps. I looked down. I was wearing this beautiful white robe. Something along those lines to clear up some of the mystery of what we experience after death, if anything. But we don't get any information from Lazarus. I heard a story on the radio a few months ago about a man who is, was in his late 30s and he had a heart attack in the middle of playing drums at a concert. And he passed out and his heart stopped beating. But his friends started doing CPR pretty quickly and they kept up this chain of CPR for like an hour and a half and got him to the hospital. And even though his heart had stopped and had been out of commission for that long, um, the doctors were able to bring him back to life. And it was this amazing medical event. Like he was out a long time. But... It erased his memory for about two weeks. So now he's back to drumming, and he takes an aspirin every day. And the mystery continues to be a mystery. So that brings me to our myth buster for the week. 
hell. Now, I don't know, I will admit right now, I don't know anything more about the afterlife than anyone sitting in this room. But I do think it's time that I admit that I don't really believe in hell. Sometimes someone does something just terrible, just awful, just just gut-wrenching. You can't even understand how people can be that way, how they can do that to someone else. And when I hear about something like that, I kind of wish there were a hell for that person to go to. <laughs> but there could be a place where justice could be done, where they could feel the pain they inflicted, where the helplessness of their victim, the terror, and the loss are experienced. Because hell after death is a really good solution to the problem of justice, right? All kinds of terrible things happen in the world, and some of those are done by powerful people who are never going to have to face justice. And it would be really nice if after they died, there was a judgment and a punishment by a more powerful and fairer force in the world, a righting of the wrong, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. And it's possible that something like that happens, I don't know. But the problem is, I don't really see that being how God works in our lives now. That kind of an image of God is not consistent with um, how I understand God to be. The Psalms are always complaining about this. I mean, describing this. How God is forgiving, how slow to anger. The prophet Jonah complains about it in the book with his name. He didn't want to go to Nineveh to preach to the people there because he knew that if they repented, then God wouldn't punish them. I knew you were a patient God, Jonah complains, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast faithfulness, and it really makes me mad, to, <laughs> to paraphrase. And in our story today with Jesus, we see how much it hurt Jesus to countenance the loss of Lazarus, a single person, even though he knows that Lazarus will be alive again in just a few minutes. So how could someone who's so sensitive and loving Imagine and plan for an eternity of torment for the majority of the world's population. How could a God who loves each of us with a deep and individual attention then throw us into a lake of fire because we didn't pray the right prayer or worship in the right church? The God I know is just not like that at all. Now, the thing that's nice about hell is that it lets us create kind of a select group of individuals who will belong there. Hitler's at the top of the list, right? And then maybe Osama bin Laden. And then after that, some serial killers, some murderers, abusers, rapists, psychopaths. And then who? Does Harry Truman go in? He sent an atom bomb that killed millions of civilians. And then sent another one over before there was a chance to respond to the first one. Seems like something a candidate for hell would do. What about Christopher Columbus? He enslaved and killed an entire tribe of natives when he colonized the Dominican Republic. George Washington owned people. So did a bunch of other signers of the Declaration of Independence. Should they go in the hopper? What about people who wear clothes made in a sweatshop? Or who look the other way rather than facing someone's pain and loss? Or who eat bananas and beef and peppers shipped across the ocean? The thing is that once there's no hell, there's no dividing line between us. Uh, and them, between them and us. Um, there, at the same time, there's no stick that church authorities can use to beat people into submission. There's no... Uh, sorry, I went the wrong way. There's no violent God backing up the official doctrine and justifying the burning of heretics. There's no threat hanging over your head to make you say the right prayer, and there's no despairing fear pushing you to pressure family and friends and random people on the Internet into agreeing, from you, agreeing with you. We are all free from that. But without help, we have to admit that we're all a little bit of a mess and in varying states of needing God's forgiveness and renewal. There's no safe zone of basically bad people who can be walled off from the rest of us. Some cases are more extreme than others, of course, but no sin, no mistake we make, no hurt we do can get between us and the love of God. Unless we let it. God can and does forgive terrible things and can even forgive the wrongs that we've done, the big and the small. So does that mean that murder or abuse or any of the other thousand ways that we can mistreat each other are acceptable? Of course not. God's d deep desire for us is to love and to care for each other. God is always pulling on us, always working on us, calling us to the path of love, 
to the path of life. And there is a place for justice. There is a place for putting a stop to evil deeds and to punishing evil actions. But the fact remains, God forgives us, each of us, over and over again. No one is perfect, and no one is outside the circle of God's grace. All the time, God is forgiving us and working on us to try again to do better next time, offering grace again and again, offering us new life again and again. So... If hell really isn't a thing anymore, and I'm pretty sure it's not, then it's also time for us to stop putting limits on God's love and God's ability to forgive. Let's go ahead and bury hell and let forgiveness of each other and and of ourselves be resurrected in its place. A forgiveness and a grace that transforms us, renews us, and brings us new life. May it be so, in the name of Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life. Amen. So let's have some time for silence and reflection. And our reflection question is, what is the point of living a Christian life if we don't?